What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the Saints. And on this Wednesday, in the fifth and final week of the season of Lent, we're continuing on. We're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. Jesus is going to stand trial before Pilate now. We've also got a really good quote from Martin Luther from the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. At Formula of Concord. And, uh, we're going to talk about something for our ongoing Lenten catechesis that is even more rare than talking about the Office of the Keys. We're going to talk a little bit about excommunication. Stick around. So we closed out chapter 14 where Jesus had stood trial by the religious elite on Thursday evening or the way we tell time from creation. There was evening and there was morning. Uh, very, very early on Friday. This is so Monday, Thursday evening is a part of the passion of Good Friday, which began with the suffering uh, of the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and the sweating of blood and being um, sorrowful even to the point of death. So there's already been a substantial amount of suffering, uh, dehydration, blood loss, uh, physical, psychological abuse. Uh, Jesus tried, condemned as a blasphemer for only speaking the truth. And of course, yesterday, Peter being set free for speaking a lie. So now we pick up in Mark chapter 15, verse 1. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, I, very early on in this series, I made reference to Mark as an author making great use of the word immediately. And this gospel account of his trial before Pilate is... I think the briefest of all the gospel accounts of it, there's no back and forth, there's no details about the, the inner court or Pilate taking a specific seat of judgment or even sending him off to Herod. There's no conversation about what is truth. There's just cut and dry. And there's no detail that Pilate had Jesus scourged to spare him from crucifixion because he wouldn't normally crucify someone who had been scourged. The scourging was terrible enough. But this, Mark moves fast. And he even used that, that word. It would be interesting to see how many times we've heard the word immediately reading this gospel. But Jesus says really nothing. Uh, fulfilling for us the prophecies that as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus is the truth. He has come to bear witness to the truth. And all who hear his voice, Jesus would tell Pilate hear the truth but Jesus is silent here the truth has already gotten him condemned and I, I watched a documentary once about who killed Jesus it was interesting to see the secular scholars conclude based on the gospels Jesus was in charge the entire time he planned this whole thing and made sure that it came to fruition and that's absolutely true Jesus is a king, the kingship of Jesus at this point in the gospel narratives is very, very potent. And he exercises in his passiveness his kingship. And he is robed in purple, 
by Pilate. He is crowned. He is given a reed. Never mind that he's beaten with it or that the, the the purple robe is meant to mock him and when it's taken off would open back up the wounds on his back. Never mind the, 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 the mocking, the suffering, the shame which Jesus gladly endures, the shame of the cross. So we move now to our writing from Martin Luther from the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. In his treatise on the last words of David, which Dr. Luther wrote shortly before his death, he says the following. According to the second, the temporal, human birth, Christ was also given the eternal dominion of God, yet temporarily and not from eternity. For the human nature of Christ was not from eternity, as his divine nature was. It is computed that Jesus, Mary's son, is 1,543 years old this year, but from the moment when deity and humanity were united in one person, the man, Mary's son, is and is called Almighty God, who has eternal dominion, who has created all things and preserves them through the communication of attributes, because he is one person with the Godhead and is also very God. Christ refers to this in Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And in Matthew twenty eight eighteen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. To which me? To me, Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's incarnate son. I had this from my Father from eternity before I became man. But when I became man, it was imparted to me in time according to my human nature. And I kept it concealed until my resurrection and ascent into heaven, and it was to be manifested and glorified. Thus St. Paul declares in Romans 1.4, he was glorified, or designated Son of God in power. John speaks of this as being glorified in chapter 7, verse 39. Wow, striking, striking comparison here from the, the people who put together the uh, treasury of daily prayer. Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate, beaten, mocked, scourged, crowned with thorns. And who is he? He is, Luther writes, the God-man. And, and Luther talks about this communication of attributes, this divine and human nature. And um, Jesus, human, humanity is much older now than 1,543 years at the time of Luther writing this. But he is, at the same time, Jesus is you know, about 2,000 years old, he's also eternal. Why? Because he's God and man. And all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. He has this glorification that he, in his human nature, in his state of humiliation, restrained. So this is the kingship of Christ. He is God and he is man. Now, our Lenten catechesis is going to seem really weird, but it's worth talking about. So these uh, quotes come to us from the Small Called Articles on Excommunication and Repentance. The greater excommunication, as the Pope calls it, we regard only as a civil penalty, and it does not concern us ministers of the Church, but the lesser, truly Christian excommunication is this. Open and hard-hearted sinners are not admitted to the sacrament or other communion of the church until they amend their lives and avoid sin. 1 Corinthians 5. Ministers should not mingle secular punishments with the punishments of the church or excommunication. So you see, uh, taking a break here, Luther's excommunication by Pope Leo meant that uh, the state was going to kill him. So uh, what Luther is saying here is his part of his two-kingdom theology uh, that church and state have separate responsibilities. The New Testament keeps and urges this office of the law, as St. Paul does when he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, Romans 1.18. Also, the whole world may be accountable to God. No human being will be justified in his sight, Romans 3, 19 through 20. And Christ says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, John 16, 8. This is God's thunderbolt. By the law, he strikes down both obvious sinners and false saints, 
he declares no one to be in the right, but drives them all together to terror and despair. This is the hammer, as Jeremiah says, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? Chapter 23, verses, verse 29. This is not active contrition or manufactured repentance. It is passive contrition, true sorrow of heart, suffering, and the sensation of death. This is what true repentance means. Here, a person needs to hear something like this. You are all of no account whether you are obvious sinner or saints in your own opinions. You have to become different from what you are now. You have to act differently than you are acting now. Whether you are as great, wise, powerful, and holy as you can be, here no one is godly. But to this office of the law, the New Testament immediately adds the consoling promise of grace through the gospel. Whenever the law alone exercises its office without the gospel being added, there is nothing but death and hell. On the other hand, the gospel brings consolation and forgiveness. It does so through the word and the sacraments. An introduction to excommunication and repentance. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you released many from their bondage to sin, death, and the devil as the healer of the nations. But when it came time to release you, the crowd chose murderer instead. Through our co-crucifixion with you in the waters of our baptism, may we continually be released from our sin as we confess you to be our everlasting King. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.